to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Through the minor prophet Hosea, God said, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Hosea chapter 4, verse number 6. Welcome to our study of the minor prophets, and in particular today, the book of Hosea. The Gospel of Christ program is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ, overseen by the elders of the Central Church of Christ in McMinnville, Tennessee. We're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. If you'd like to get a copy of today's lesson, you can see our contact information at the end of this lesson, or you can visit us on the website at thegospelofchrist.com. When we think about the book of Hosea, we're talking about a section of books known as the Minor Prophets. And I want to say just a little bit about the breakdown, the categorization of the Major Prophets and the Minor Prophets. Maybe just a little bit misleading in the sense that Major Prophets does not mean that their messages are more important or major, and Minor Prophets by their very nature are not lesser important. The only reason they're called the Major Prophets and the Minor Prophets is because of the volume size of the books. For example, Jeremiah Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel are rather large prophetic books. And then you've got books like Jonah, which is four chapters, or Obadiah, which is one. And so they're smaller in size, but not in the content and the power pack messages that they contain. What then is the book of Hosea all about? Well, Israel is in a very dark time. A time when they're steeped in sin, they're chasing after the other nations, they're following the idols, they're not staying true to God, and as a result, they're involved in spiritual adultery. That's what Hosea is all about. The major point is unfaithfulness to God. Israel's unfaithfulness to God is deemed by God as spiritual adultery and will bring their judgment and ultimate downfall if they don't restore God to His proper place and therefore by application. Anything that gets in the way of Christ, of God, of the kingdom coming first, Matthew 6, by God is still deemed as spiritual adultery. And friends, we'll have to give an account of if God doesn't come first. And so the key problem in, in Hosea's time is there's no mercy. There's no truth. There's no knowledge of God in Israel. Mercy's perished. Truth is perished. Love of God, where is that? Hosea 4 verse 1 makes that point vividly clear. Now, as we mentioned, key idea, key verse, probably Hosea 4 verse 6 where God cries out, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Knowledge was so essential to the people of Israel. God wanted them to teach their children, to put it on the doorpost, to have it everywhere where people could know God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. And yet today, knowledge of God is still so important. Do you remember what Jesus said in John 8, verse 32? You shall know the truth, and truth will make you free. Friend, we must know God, know His will, and strive every day to live faithfully to Him. For Jesus said in Revelation 2 verse 10, Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. You know, we talk about Israel not knowing God. And by application, people not knowing God today, we're not really talking about necessarily facts. Facts are included in that. Bible knowledge is included in that, no doubt, in the sense that I know what the book says, but it goes a little further than that. Philippians 4 verse 9, Paul said, The things which you heard or received and saw and learned in me, these do, 
and the God of peace will be with you. It's not just knowing that for Israel, God delivered the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai and entered into a covenant relationship with them. That was a key, essential, but it's knowing God every day of their life, loving Him, living faithful to Him, respecting and honoring Him in every way. And friend, the same is true for each and every one of us. I may know the New Testament as far as facts go, but have I taken that covenant, that law, that message of God's grace and love and mercy and applied it to my everyday life? One of the key words in the book of Hosea is the word return. This word is used 15 times in this book, and this is God's appeal. This is a, what God desires. The people have gone after the nations. They're following the idols. They're living in immorality and sin, and God is pleading with them, repent and return to me before it's too late, before judgment comes, before things happen that it's beyond a point that you can return. Friend, we see from the New Testament that this is also such a, a practical and loving message from the heart of God. Let me illustrate. Luke chapter 15. This is a lot like Israel's situation as well. Luke chapter 15, you've got that prodigal son. Takes his inheritance, all the blessings of the father, what the father's left him, goes to that far country, spends it on prodigal living, finds himself in the muck and the mire or the hog pen, and then he comes to himself and he says, my father's servants have got so much better than I do. I'm going to go home. I'm going to say to my father, I've sinned against you in heaven. Make me a servant. And do you remember what the father does? He sees the son coming in the distance, embraces him, restores him to not servant but son. When the son was ready to return, the father had his arms open, ready to restore, to heal, and to, to bless again. Friend, that's the idea of God. God wants His children. God wants His people to turn from sin and turn to Him. Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Repent and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. Now, let's talk for just a moment about some of the lessons we find throughout the book of Hosea that really drive some of the principles of Christianity or, or God home for Christians today. How does a minor prophet written in the Old Testament apply to us today? Well, here are some of the living messages of the book of Hosea. Number one, Hosea's harlot wife illustration shows that God does give His people up and He will turn them over and let them live in sin, but if they'll turn back, he'll take them. Now, we say harlot wife illustration for this reason. Hosea chapter 1, beginning in verses 1 through 4, God says to Hosea, I want you to go take a wife by the name of Gomer. She's a harlot. I want you to marry her, have children with her, and stay with her. Now, she doesn't stay with him, but she does bear him children. Those children are given names representative of Israel's failure, their adultery and all that goes with that, and even his own wife at times plays the harlot. But when she returns, Hosea takes her back. What's the point? Friends, sometimes when people live a life of sin and they come to their senses and they realize how good they really had it, God's willing, if they're willing to repent, God's willing to take them back. Let's realize first that sin is spiritual adultery. Just as Gomer played the harlot, so those who live in sin are, having a, are playing the harlot with sin in a sense. For example, James 4 verse 4 says this, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore desires to be a friend of the world has made himself God's enemy. How does God view worldliness? Adultery. How did God view Israel's sin? Adultery. Is God willing to take them back? You bet He is. 2 Peter 3, verse number 9, The Lord is not slow concerning His promises, as some men count slowness, but He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but at all should come to repentance. Now, from the book of Hosea, though, we do learn that sin does bring separation and makes us 
illegitimate, makes us unfaithful children in the sight of God. I want you to notice what Hosea chapter 1, verse number 9 says. The scripture reads, Then God said of the child that was born to Hosea and Gomer, Call his name Loami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. The word Loami, which they were to name their son, literally means not my people, not my son. And so God's in essence saying, Gomer, you're a harlot. You've played the harlot on Hosea. You've given birth to a son, but it's not his son. You're not my children. The point is that her unfaithfulness brought about an illegitimate son. And Israel's unfaithfulness makes them unfaithful or illegitimate in the sight of God. Friends, we're learning a hard lesson about sin here in the book of Hosea. God clearly teaches us throughout the Bible, sin brings separation. It severs that father-son, father-daughter relationship. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, the scripture records, The Lord's ear is not heavy, that he cannot hear. His arms not shortened, that he cannot save, but your sins and your iniquities have separated you from your God. Why? Because God can't look at sin. Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. God is of purer eyes than to behold evil and to look upon wickedness. Friends, let's realize the devastating, damaging nature of sin. God hates it. God abhors it. God doesn't want His children involved in it. And when they do, they separate themselves from God. And so realize how damaging sin is for the child of God. Is there hope in the book of Hosea? Oh, you bet there is. Hosea chapter 2 verse 15 mentions a very interesting idea about this hope. Notice Hosea chapter 2 and what the scripture says in verse number 15. God says of Israel, I will give her vineyards from there and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up from the land of Egypt. This is a, a very interesting image. What in the world is this valley of Achor as a door of hope? Well, what happened in the Old Testament in the valley of Achor? Well, in Joshua chapter 7, verse number 26, you've got the sin of Achan, where he took that bar of gold, that Babylonian garment, he hid it in his tent, and the people started losing battles. Things started getting bad. What was going on there? Because of Achan's sin, God started removing himself from all of Israel. What's the point of the Valley of Achor as a door of hope? God's teaching his people. There's going to have to be some purifying. There's going to have to be some discipline. You're going to have to realize the hard way. Just as Achan and his whole family perished, God's going to have to bring swift judgment. Discipline's going to have to occur. Correction's going to be necessary because God loves His people. You know, the Bible teaches in Hebrews 12, verse 9 following, that a father disciplines his children out of love, and so God does the same. Friends, sometimes for people to see the error of their way, for people to maybe be shaken to the core and realize how important their soul is, how devastating sin is, and, and how much they need God. Hard times, discipline, difficulty has to occur. Sometimes this may be church discipline. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Sometimes it may be temptations and trials that come into our life. But friend, we ought in each of those to examine ourselves just as Israel needed to do. Put, put away sin and really live for God each and every day. The heart of the book of Hosea and the heart of the problem is found in Hosea chapter 4 verse 6. I want you to notice what this verse says. Look at Hosea chapter 4 verse number 6. Hosea says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priests for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. Friend, when we think about 
just how important it is that we know God, that we know His law, and that we put His principles to practice in everyday life. Here's a clear example. God says, here's Israel. She's like this harlot Gomer. Uh, what's going to happen? They're going to be destroyed. Why? Lack of knowledge. Knowing God every day. Living for Him. They, they forgot who God was. Not in the sense that they didn't know who He was, but in the sense that they weren't putting Him to practice in every decision they made, every action in their life. God was not first. Now, friend, part of the principle here is we do have to know God's law. We do have to study to show ourselves approved unto God. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Yes, every Christian needs to search the Scriptures daily to find out if what he's being told and the way he's living is true. We need to be ready to give an answer. But it's more than just the facts. I've got to know the truth and that truth will make me free. John 8, 32. I've got to know that I, I, I am right with God, that I'm living it, that I'm trying every day to follow His commands. Someone says, well, how do you know? I mean, it's not hard. If a man's willing to read the Bible, if a person's willing to study the Word of God, it's not hard to know whether your life is in line with the will of God. Can you fool yourself and do some people? Sure. But friend, I believe even those people know. If I'm studying the Bible, and if I'm living as God wants me to live, I can know God. I can know His will, but just as true, I can know that I'm not living like God wants me to. And so let's be honest with ourselves. Let's be honest with the Scriptures. Do we really know God in the sense that He is an active part in every decision? He's the first part in every decision and action that we make in our lives. Now, another part of the problem in Israel was that they were following leaders who were not following God. In the book of Hosea, we find the idea that as the priest goes, so goes the nation. Look in Hosea chapter 4, verse number 9. Notice what the scripture here says. God says, And it shall be like people, like priests. So I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their deeds. You know, we find in Jeremiah chapter 5, kind of part of the problem that was going on. Verses 30 and 31, God says through Jeremiah, an astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. Well, what is it, God? The priest prophesy or rule by their own authority. The prophets prophesy falsely, and my people love to have it so. But God asked this question, but what will you do in the end? The priest, whose authority are they following? Not God's, their own authority. The prophets prophesying falsely. Well, what do the people think about these atrocities? Priests following their own authority, prophets prophesying falsely? That's what they want. They love to have it so. And God says, you're really not thinking about the end. You're not thinking with a view toward eternity. Friend, as the priest goes, so goes the nation. There's such a practical lesson here. For the Lord's church, as the home goes, so goes those in the home. As father and mother go, if they're really leaders in the home, if God really comes first, what a great impact that home can have on the church, on society, on the family in general. Take it down just a little further. As the elders in the congregation are, so the congregation will be led. We need godly elders, men who meet the qualifications. 1 Timothy 3, Titus chapter 1, men in, who are concerned about people's souls. Hebrews 13, 17, who have the backbone to stand up and do right it. And if you've got elders who are really qualified, who are trying to do that, the congregation will be led in the right direction. As goes the preaching, so goes the hearing as well. What about the preacher? The preacher says he must preach the Word. 2 Timothy 4 verse 2. He must speak as the whole counsel of God. Acts 20 verses 27 and 28. Part of the problem sometimes is people aren't really getting fed the Word of God. And then, of course, we could bring it down to the nation. What about the leaders of our nation today? Are they godly leaders? Are we putting in people who would be godly people? As go the leaders of the nation, 
so often goes the people as well. And so, so many practical ways we can understand and think about this great lesson and how we need God. And you know, along those lines of needing God, Hosea teaches us another great lesson, and it's this. Let's not wait till crisis time to finally seek God. Look at Hosea chapter 5, verse number 15. Here's what the people have done. They've got themselves in a crisis, and they say this. I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offense. Then they will seek my face. God says in their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. Who were they looking at? Who were they trying to follow? You know, friend, when we think about Israel, you know, this is just like the book of Judges. Israel for a time would follow God. Everything would be going great. And then they'd get jealous of the nations around them and, and they would look to their gods and they would follow their leaders and what would happen? Well, they'd go into captivity. They'd go into oppression. They would cry out to God. God would send a deliverer or a judge. And often it was, they waited right till the worst, till they were in the deepest trouble, in the worst affliction in crisis time. They called out to God. Israel had a bad habit of doing that. Friend, I wonder, sometimes are we that way? Do we wait until we just desperately can't live without God? Until we're in crisis time to look to Him? Do we wait till crisis hits and then we pray to Him? Do we wait till there's some difficulty or challenge in our life and then we say, you know, I probably need to be more spiritual. I need to start seeking the kingdom first. I need to read my Bible more. Let's not wait till crisis. That, that doesn't do any good. We, we've wasted so much time and effort. Seek God first every day. Philippians 1.21, Paul said, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I, I've been crucified with Christ. Galatians 2 verse 20, Live for Christ every day and then we're ready. We're ready when crisis does strike to know that God will be with us. Now, I want you to think about for just a moment, how Israel and, and God wanted Israel to put first things first. Look at Hosea chapter 6. Now I want you to notice what verse number 6 says. God says, here's what God really wants of Israel. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Now this passage may at first seem a little confusing, but really the emphasis is not upon that fact that God didn't want sacrifice and God didn't want burnt offerings. They were still trying to go through the, the rituals, the formality, the, the things that they did every day, but they were leaving out the most important. And so what is it God's trying to get across? God's saying, put aside these sacrifices, put away these burnt offerings, here's what I want first, then do those things. What is it God wanted? I desire mercy, not sacrifice alone. I desire knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. God's saying, don't give me your sacrifice. Don't put your burnt offering on the altar. If mercy and knowledge are not there, don't even come to the altar and try to make some sacrifice. You know, sometimes we can get caught up with the legalities. I've gone to church. I've partaken the Lord's Supper. I have given when the contribution was passed. I've done these things, therefore, I've been faithful. Wait a minute now. Those things are important, but God wants us to live for Him every day, not just on Sunday. Are we seeking the lost every day of the week? Are we doing good to our neighbors and friends? Galatians 6 verse 10. Are we helping the poor? Are we reaching out to the needy? Are we striving to do good to all those around us? Friend, really, mercy and knowledge of God, knowing God and living for Him every day, having mercy, love God, and love your neighbor as yourself, those are things that sometimes, if we're not careful, fall by the wayside. And we kind of get our checklist out and go through, well, I've, I've done these things, therefore. Israel seemed to be in that same problem, and God was not at all happy with that. Now, let's turn for just a moment and, and let's think about as we think about the book of Hosea and, and what this book is really all about and what God is trying to, to get across, God wants Israel to see. They've got to kind of break things up. They've got to start over. Their hearts have become hard, but they can break that up 
and be right with God. How? God says, break up your fallow ground. Look in Hosea chapter 10, verse number 12. The scripture reads in Hosea chapter 10, verse number 12, Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till He comes and rains righteousness on you. Well, what in essence is God saying? Seek righteousness, mercy, break up your fallow ground. Well, what is fallow ground? Fallow ground is ground that's got real crusty and hard on top, and, and it takes a little bit of work. It takes some effort. It takes a little sweat, maybe blood and tears, to get through that hard part to where the soil is still good where it can be planted, where things can grow. You've got to get the other stuff out of the way first. Friend, God's crying out to the people here. Break your heart. Open it up. Be moldable and shapeable like the clay in the potter in Jeremiah 18. God's saying, I need you to come back to me. I need you to make your heart tender again and put first things first. Isn't that so true with every child of God? Is my heart still tender? Can the Word of God still prick my heart and, and have the effect on me that it ought to have in every way so that we can really live for Him? You know, friend, as we think about the book of Hosea, it's a sad book because Israel is headed for destruction if they don't change. God is lovingly pleading to Israel, begging them to make it right. And friend, God still pleads with men and women today. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Is our heart open to? Do we really know God every day? Are we seeking Him first? If you're not a child of God, friend, more than anything, we urge you today to become a Christian. Have you heard God's Word? For faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Having heard that word, do you believe in Jesus as the Son of God? John 8, 24. Are you willing to repent and turn to God? Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Would you make the great confession just as the Ethiopian eunuch did? I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and to be saved, would you be baptized? Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16. If you've never done that, we urge you to become a child of God. If as a child of God, maybe like Israel, things have gotten in the way. Friend, we urge you to remove those things, return to God, and live in such a way that heaven can be your home. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.